guess you gotta hold him. He'll be okay now. James and Haley are here. No. <laughs> you, need, you need some electrolytes. Apparently. Good morning, everybody. Good, Good morning. morning. I want to welcome you to worship here at Mount Calvary United Methodist Church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen, church? Amen. Brothers and sisters, it is an exciting morning here today. We're excited because not only for worship, but we are receiving four new members of the church this morning. So, very good, very exciting stuff. And so there's a few announcements as we get started. Um, first of all, if you're ordering Easter flowers, they are due today. That form is in the narthex, and you can put your form in the box that's next to it in the narthex. Today is the last day to get items in for Ukraine for what we are currently collecting. Um, the list of stuff will likely change this week, and if there's a new set of things to collect, we will let you know and update you about that. I have a feeling that's the way it's going to work um, over the next couple of months because the needs for the Ukrainian people are going to be consistently changing. Disciple Bible Study is back this Tuesday at 6.30 p.m., and Thursday morning we have our Revelation Bible Study. Next week, I will not be here, but we will have two awesome speakers from an organization called Someone to Tell It To, and uh, they offer a ministry of basically listening with love. And it's been an incredible ministry that's expanded and grown over the last 10 years, and uh, Pastor Mike and Tom, we're certainly going to bless you guys. Um, keep note of the events coming up for Palm Sunday with children. We're going to do a lot of things with the kiddos on Palm Sunday. It's all in your bulletins. And otherwise, check out the spring mission trip info, and we're still looking for people to participate in that. Any other announcements to be made this morning? Youth group parents. This week, uh, you'll get a poll in the Facebook Messenger group on what day will work for us to have a meeting to speak about the upcoming curriculum for the youth group. Uh, so be sure to look out for that. I'm thinking Thursday, maybe Friday, something like that. So keep your eyes open. Is that the birds and bees curriculum? That is. All right. Nature <laughs> is a plenty here. <laughs> Did you say nature is a plenty? Yeah, nature is a plenty. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to stop. We need to stop. All right. All righty, guys. Let us have a word of prayer as we get started this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you this day for the incredible blessings of being together. And Lord, though it's cold and snowing sort of outside, God, your Son warms our lives today and warms our hearts. So Jesus, this morning, through our worship, through our praying, through all we're going to do, we just pray, God, that it would all be for your glory. 
We pray these things in your name and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we join our opening songs this morning.
God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, I had the chance to have one of the great joys in ministry, and that is the chance to receive new members into the church. So everyone can be seated except for our four folks who are going to be becoming members at this time. Come on up. Come on up here. <laughs> Look, he slipped you money. <laughs> all right. You feel all nervous? Because all the eyes are on you right now, Serena. All of that. <laughs> all righty, guys. So, I'm very excited to present to you today, this is an alphabetical order, Thomas S. Billington, Matthew Boyd, Serena Boyd, and Amanda Moore for reception into the United Methodist Church. And they are all being received by profession of faith, which is awesome, because what it means is it's the first public profession that these folks have made of their belief in Jesus to a church body. And so, I have a few questions for you guys. We went over these last week. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened up to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. 
And now we, church, as the body of Christ, have a responsibility to these folks here, and we are going to help to nurture them when it comes to their faith and their relationship with God. So on the screen, you will see here this. This is for you, church. Do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now for you four, as members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, say, I will. And as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. Welcome as formal members of Mount Calvary United Methodist Church. Congratulations. And we have lovely prizes for you. We have certificates, which my, my secretary even put in like its own folder with like a labeled name on it there, because she's amazing. Amen to that. And this is the only group of people I've ever met that have been like, when am I getting offering envelopes? So here are your offering envelopes, guys. Congratulations. And again, let us welcome our new friends to the church. You guys can head down. Thank you guys so much. We are so thankful that you guys have decided to worship with us and become members here. And I really mean that. I really, really do. And at this time, we'll have another time of celebrating as we'll have the kids forward for children's time this morning. Your parents were supposed to bring like the steak and the cake for the reception, right? We're all good. <laughs> What'd you say? Steak and cake. Steak and cake. That's how it works. Yeah, come on up, Lena. Have a seat. Pastor Jim's going to be silly this morning. <laughs> all right, good morning, kiddos. Good morning. How are you guys all doing today? Good. Now listen, usually there's an order we do things during our day. You're supposed to do one thing and then another. Sometimes I think that's boring. And so today I thought I would do some things in a different order. For example, like, you know, we always put our socks on and then we put our shoes on, Right. Well, maybe today I just want to put my sock over my shoe. I think that would work out well. Oh, right there. There. That works, right? There, for everybody who wants to see. <laughs> Don't fall. I got balance, yo. I'm good. <laughs> so, so what do you guys think? I mean, so what do you guys think? Does that work? No. No, it doesn't. Well, how about this? Okay, maybe that doesn't work. But you know what? It actually fits surprisingly well. But you know what? You know what else I get really sick of is like when you wash your hands, what do you do first when you wash your hands? What's the first thing you do? Put soap on. That's right. Well, you know what? I want to do it differently today. So you know what? I'm going to get my hands all nice and wet first. And we're going to make sure they're all nice and rubbed the way that we're supposed to. I'm not going to do all 30 seconds here. And then let's put the soap on now. This should be great. 
All righty then. Let's do that. That'll work. That'll work. Because you know what? Sometimes we just want to do things differently. That's right. And you know what? I'm feeling all good and clean and kind of squeaky right now. And weirdly sticky. And, uh, well, maybe that, uh, I don't know. Maybe that didn't quite go the way that I wanted it to. Maybe I should have done that differently. But you know what? You know what I'm really tired of doing the way everyone tells me to do it? Brushing my teeth, okay? What's the first thing you do when you brush your teeth? Yeah. You put the toothpaste on. You know what? I think I'm going to wash it out first. I think that would work better. Here. Mm. There we go. We'll wash that out first. And now my, my mouth is halfway there. It's good to be clean. And now we'll get the toothpaste on my toothbrush here, my handy dandy toothbrush here. And I'll just flush my teeth. You know? This is going to work great. My teeth are getting all nice and clean, just the way the dentist wants them to. It's all nice and good. All right. And I'm done. So, what do you guys think? Did that work? No, it didn't really work. Yeah. Maybe there's a reason we do things the way that we do them. I don't know. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break my rule here. I'm going to... Mm. There we go. Elgie, are you taking after me? You're taking your sock off. <laughs> All righty, guys. So that was pretty silly, wasn't it? I mean, there's a reason... i got to get this soap off my hands. There's a reason that we do things a certain way, right? Because it's what's best. We have to put first things first. Have you guys ever heard that phrase, first things first? Yeah, we have to have first things first. Do I have toothpaste in my beard? That happens sometimes. Is it cleaned off? Yeah, do I have anything in my teeth? No. I need my teeth to look good, you know. So, all right. So, we need to put first things first. And, you know, sometimes in life, people encourage us not to put first things first. For example, when it comes to God, we're always supposed to put God first. But sometimes people want to tell us to do other things first. Like money. A lot of people think money comes first. Or sports comes first. Or YouTube comes first before God. Now I'm sure none of you put YouTube before God. But some people do. And the problem is, when we don't put God first, things become a mess. And so it's really important to remember throughout your life, do you know how many times people want to encourage you to do things that maybe aren't what God wants you to do, but it's always important that you make a decision that puts God first. And when you do, you get to enjoy things the way they're meant to be enjoyed. So don't be like Pastor Jim. Don't try and change things up. Put God first always. Okay, guys? Let's say our prayer. God, I love you, and I know you love me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> All right, it's lollipop time. Oh my goodness, it's, it, it's good. Okay, you got one for Parker. But Parker's here. But, but, but Parker's here, he might want to pick his own. All righty. Come on, girls. Lena, you can get a lollipop. Kelly, Lena, Parker, do you want what he gave you or do you want your own? I want my own because I already opened it. You already opened that? All right, you can keep that, but pick your own. That's fine. Give the other one to your mom. <laughs> All righty, guys. Good job, everyone. Lena, go back to mommy and daddy. You guys did good. You're welcome. You're welcome, everyone. All righty. What do you think? This is a good look. Yeah. This would work in Milan. Paris, go on the runway. Actually, I will probably slip if I keep this on here. So, and then everyone will laugh as I tumble and fall, and then I will need a cardiovascular technologist. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty, guys. So, we're going to join now in sharing our prayer requests and our praises to our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, I asked this week over email that we would keep a 13-year-old girl named Iana in prayers. Iana has terminal cancer. She's at the med center right now. And we just ask for prayers for healing and also peace for her. 
other prayers or praises to lift up this morning. Yay! So Emily's going to college. Our little girl's growing up. And, and, and tell everyone, I know you said in the first verse, tell everyone what you're going to be studying. Auto high performance motorsports. You can't possibly get into any trouble studying that. Can't imagine. But we're proud of you. Is that a two year or four year or? It's a three-year, okay, three-year degree. Excellent. Well, we are proud of you, kiddo, and uh, we know you're going to do great, absolutely. So, awesome news. Others to share this morning. Yeah, Dave. We want to keep Sheila in prayer for healing, and actually she came because she wanted to see you guys become members. And so, uh, so she's heading back home to feel better now, but so, yeah, she loves you guys and you know, wants, you, wants you guys to know that. You know, uh, last week we were praying for Nick for a good surgery, and he is with us and doing well, and so a little sore still, but we're good to go. Good to go. They didn't take any limbs or anything, so woke up all healthy. That's the key. The first key is waking up, and then it's, and then it's counting the digits, so Awesome. Other, yes, Owen. <laughs> All righty. So, Ashley's turning 29 for the first time this week. So, we praise God for that. Absolutely. Happy early birthday. Others to share. Yeah, DJ. I can only imagine. That's awesome. Yeah. For friends online who couldn't hear DJ when his grandmother passed away, he sang I Can Only Imagine at her funeral, and a couple years, three years later now, on the anniversary of her passing, someone actually liked the video and left a nice comment. So yeah, it's amazing the things that we do that we don't realize are going to touch people's lives. So that's tremendous. Awesome. I see a hand over here. If not, okay. Any others? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Please. Welcome. We're glad to have you with us. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, we're so glad to have you guys with us and for making the trip. And where do you guys live? Halifax. Halifax. That's a short drive. We'll see you next week. <laughs> so... <laughs> No, but seriously, it's, it's George, right? George and Barbara? No, Roger, Roger, because Roger Moore. Yes, Roger and Barbara, yes. So, yes, Roger Moore and Mandy Moore. So, <laughs> but thank you guys for being here with us. We greatly appreciate it. Any other prayers or praises? Yes, LJ? <laughs> he needs a wipe, okay. All right, let's, oh, Mom, I'm sorry. Yeah, Mom. All right. Well, we 
praise God that a friend, family friend of ours named Russ is doing well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this gathering of the body of Christ today, the chance to take in new members, for the, for the cries of children that remind us that life is in this church, Lord. And God, we pray this day for all those that are hurting. We think about the people of Ukraine and all that they are enduring right now, God. But we are grateful that you are still loving them throughout. I just heard this morning, Lord, from someone who talked to the bishop in Ukraine of the Methodist Church that their churches are packed right now. And we ask that you would continue to just strengthen their faith during this difficult time. But thank you, God, for new life. Thank you for love. Thank you for healing. And thank you for your presence. As we pray these things in your name, Jesus, and all of God's children said, amen. I'd like to invite Carol Worthford at this time for our scripture reading this morning. Excuse, excuse my mess. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sock on the floor. Mine. Yes. It reminds me of why I'm not married anymore. <laughs> mess, you know. Wow. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> wow. Hey, hey, I'm reading the scripture here. <laughs> LJ doesn't care, Carol. It's a, yeah. It's a rough crowd. If you will put your ears on and listen to the word of God, please. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, Remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him mourn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. And together we say, thanks, thanks be, be to, to God. God. Thank you, Carol. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this day, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, may these be your words, O God, not mine. Amen. Today we are talking about one of the most and maybe the most important subjects that we don't talk enough about, and that is eternal consequences. When I first became a Christian, I did not fully comprehend the importance of eternal consequences. I remember I was so excited when I got saved, and I, I had just gone to college, and I was just ready to like tell everyone that I could about Jesus, and I just wanted everyone to come to know him, everyone to be saved. And I remember at one point even saying to someone, I don't care if I have to go to hell itself so that somebody else would be able to be saved. I'm willing to do it. Well... Not anymore, <laughs> because I have a better understanding of the differences between heaven and hell, and I'm thankful that God has not asked me, will never ask me to do such a thing. But we all need to understand the differences between heaven 
and hell. It's not something we talk about very much in church. And in the story that we hear this morning, let me be clear, this isn't an event that actually happens. It's a parable of Jesus. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. There is a character in it named Lazarus. It's not the same one, though, that actually Jesus raises from the dead. But in this story, Jesus wants those that are listening to understand something that's critically important, and that is that, come on, click or click. All right. And that is that there are options to our eternity. Hey, well, my clicker didn't click. There we go. We heard Jesus talk about this in the parable in Luke 16, 22. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. So here it's very clear. There's option A, which is heaven, and option B, which is hell. And what's interesting is typically when we think about Jesus, we put him in this light of this friendly person. We see Jesus with a smile on his face unless he's hanging on the cross. But even in that experience, it's a sacrifice made in love so that we all have the chance for life. Everything we typically think about with Jesus has to do with life and goodness and joy and heaven. And those things are absolutely true. But at the same time, Jesus speaks more about hell than anyone else in the Bible. In fact, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, Jesus says, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Two-thirds of the times that the words hell or Hades, which is a Greek word for hell, are mentioned in the Bible, it's by Jesus. But just to make one thing very clear, I've heard people say this over my years in ministry, did you know that Jesus talks about hell more than heaven? And I'll say, no, I didn't know that. And the reason I don't know that is because it's not true. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew alone, Jesus talks about heaven four times as much as hell is mentioned in the entire New Testament. So it's not even close, the amount that Jesus talks about heaven versus hell. But he does want us to understand that there are options. And what do those options look like? Well, the Scriptures tell us that heaven is like a city with, made with the brilliance of costly stones and crystal clear jasper. It has 12 gates, each made of a giant pearl. And Jesus says it's filled with mansions that one day you and I will have the chance to live in. The paradise of the Garden of Eden is restored. The river of water flows from the tree of life. We'll be dressed in all white and have eternal joy and peace. Heaven is where there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain because death itself has been conquered and sin is no more. And the best thing about heaven is that we get to live in the immediate presence of Jesus for literally all of eternity. We will worship and sing together like the angels of heaven, and even people like me will have a good voice in that moment. True proof that miracles can happen. And I love this. There is no sun in heaven because God is the light. Contrast that with hell. Hell is described as a place of eternal torment, of unquenchable fire, where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret, from which there is no return, even to warn others. Jesus calls hell a place of outer darkness, comparing it to Gehenna, which was a trash dump outside the walls of Jerusalem where rubbish was burned and maggots abounded. Shame and everlasting contempt, a place of everlasting destruction, are what hell is described as, a place where torment, the smoke of torment rises forever where a lake of burning sulfur exists and where the wicked are tormented day and night. I don't know about you, but with those two particular options, it seems like the choice is clear. And yet, there will be those that will not make that choice. And it's very important to understand that it is a choice. God will never force his love on anyone. To do so would not be love. You can't make somebody love you. So God gives us free will to make the choice of whether or not we want to accept him into our lives, accept him into our hearts. And when we do so, we receive the blessings of heaven, not just when we go, but actually when we live with God in this life as well. But why would someone in hell not just say they're sorry and go to heaven? I mean, it seems pretty clear if you're in a place of burning torment that you go, you know what? I made a mistake. (laughs) And Lord, my bad. If I could just get that elevator to go back up, that would be great. But here's the catch. We do not cross from one eternal destination to another. 
Jesus tells us in the story, and besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And this is very important because if we were able to cross from one to the other, then there would be no need for us to have a relationship with Jesus in this life because it would be like just I described. You know, if you didn't know Jesus, you go to hell and then you'd be like, this is not where I want to be. So God, I'm sorry, I believe in Jesus and we'd go up. That's not how this is meant to work. We get one shot at this. We only get one shot. And it's important that we utilize this opportunity the way that God intends for us to, to accept Jesus into our lives and to accept the gifts of the kingdom of heaven. But what's interesting is that though we think it would be obvious, like if somebody didn't make it to heaven, clearly they would realize their mistake and change their minds. The scriptures tell us that that may not necessarily be the case. You see, when Lazarus realizes where he is, look at the words that he he says here. So Lazarus called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. And said, I'm sorry, not Lazarus, sorry, the rich man. Listen to what the rich man says. Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. The rich man doesn't apologize, he doesn't repent. He doesn't offer to change his ways. He's actually looking for the guy that was beneath him to come and fix his problem because that's how he lived, with people fixing his problems because he was rich. He hasn't changed. He hasn't repented. And what's what's interesting is that Jesus even warns that there are those who are told the truth and they will not listen, not only in this life but the next He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And what's even more interesting is that the scriptures tell us in the book of Revelation, as chaos is ensuing, as the world is coming to an end and God is winning his ultimate victory, those that have chosen to follow Satan will still not choose to follow God, even as they're going through the beginnings of their torment. In Revelation chapter 16, we read, They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues. But they refused to repent and glorify Him. There are those that simply will choose not to listen, not to try, not to believe. And let me just pause here for a second to share one question that often comes up a lot when people say to me, but what about like children? What about the disabled? What about people that have never heard of Jesus? Is that really fair? And what I want to remind us of is that Jesus says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. Children are in heaven. Babies are in heaven. Those that can't make that choice for themselves, they don't get penalized for that. But what's important for us to recognize is that our responsibility is still to tell everyone about Jesus that we can, so that no one that has the option and the ability chooses not to take it. Because at the end of the day, we've been given all the information that we need. This is the point that Jesus is making in his parable. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. You have everything you need to make these important choices, but the challenge is, will we? God has given us the Bible. In 2 Timothy, we read, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God has given us the ability to pray. In Jeremiah 29, we read, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. We have our church, the body of Christ that God has given us, the family of God together. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And finally, God has given us something that no other religion dares to claim because they are not real. And that is a chance to have a personal connection with Jesus. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. God has given us everything we need to make these incredibly important choices, the most important choice 
to believe in Christ, to accept him into our hearts. He's given us word. He's given us a way to communicate. He's given us a people to help us along the way. He's given us a Jesus to love us through the experience. And when push comes to shove, no matter what the world may tell us, here's the truth when it comes to being heaven-bound or not. Jesus is the only means of salvation. Jesus is the only means of salvation. Jesus answers, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And here's why that verse is particularly important. Not because it just teaches us that Jesus is the only way, but it's Jesus specifically saying this. So you may think to yourselves, or people may think to themselves, oh, this is just one of those pastors that's like, it's all about being a Christian, there's no other way to heaven, and all this stuff, blah, 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 blah. That's fine if you want to doubt me, but here you're doubting the Word of God and the Word of the Son of God Himself. And I wouldn't do that if I were you. Because at the end, there are eternal consequences. There are options to where we will spend our eternity. Jesus wants us to choose Him. And He makes it very easy. Other religions, you have to do so much. With us, it's very simple. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Declare and believe. You don't have to do a thousand different things. You don't have to say a hundred Hail Marys and 44 Hello Dollies. You don't have to go on a certain day to a certain place at a certain time, drink of a certain thing or whatever it may be. You don't need to bow down at the right times or this or that or the other thing. You proclaim and you believe. It's as simple as can be and we try to complicate it. Jesus makes it easy for us because he wants all of us to make the choice. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And you know, John 3.16 is the most famous verse in all of the world. But I'm actually, this is great, don't get me wrong, but I'm a big fan of John 3.17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God is focused on us being with him. That's the goal. God doesn't send people to hell. They choose it by not choosing Jesus. This is also something very important for us to understand. People say, why did God send that person to hell? He didn't. They make that choice when they don't accept Christ into their lives. And our God is much more a God of love, a God of life, and a God of heaven than he is a God of hell. Let me be clear about that. Heaven is mentioned 622 times in the scriptures. Hell, a whopping 13. Hades, the Greek word for hell, a whopping eight. If you want to expand it, there are some phrases like the depths or the pit or the deep that often have a connection to the idea of hell. And if you want to be as broad as you can with that, you get to about 80 or 90 examples compared to the 622 times that just the word heaven is mentioned in the scriptures. What does that mean? Our God is a God that wants to see us in heaven. There's only one way to get there, by believing in him. Why does this matter for us today? Because we have to make sure we get ourselves right if we're going to be able to try and help others. It's kind of like if you're on an airplane. First thing that they tell you, not the first thing, but when the stewardess or the steward is doing their whole spiel, they say like oxygen has to come down. Do you put it on the person next to you first? No, you put it on yourself and then you help others. Because you've got to make sure you've got yourself right before you can be as effective in helping others. We also need to do this so that way we have a chance to share the amazing nature of Jesus with our loved ones. We literally have the antidote to death. The antidote to death. It's not a medicine. It's not a prescription. It's not a vaccine that may or may not work. We have the antidote to death itself. In the life, death, resurrection, and love of Jesus. And we need to share it with those that are closest to us. And we also need to understand this for those whose lives we don't even realize we have a chance to touch. And it's with that that I want to share with you a final story this morning as we close out. About, it's 12 years ago because the date was October 10th of 2010. 10, 10, 10. We had a youth rally at my um, last town that I lived in that I had a chance to organize. Got together a whole bunch of churches. We had about 150 youth at this event. We did it at a local high school. It was awesome. We had amazing worship. We, um, I had the chance to speak. 
Um, and at the end of the night, we had about 50 kids come up and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. It went so well that we decided to do it again the next year. And when we came together, we, we wanted to kind of keep things the same, but also expand if we could. So one of the things we decided to do was give youth, any youth that wanted to, a chance to share a testimony, a story of their faith. And so that night, this girl comes on stage, who I've never met before, to my knowledge, and she gets up there and she talks about how she was at last year's rally, and how when she came, she was an atheist who was suicidal, and how she didn't know what she was going to do with her life. But that night she heard a pastor, and she said, Pastor Jim, preach on resetting your life. And suddenly I remembered that's what I was preaching on. I had an image of an old Nintendo video game system that had a reset button, and that was my theme. I didn't even remember that until she said it. And she said, that night when I heard that message, I came down front, and Pastor Jim prayed with me, and I accepted Christ as my Lord. And since that day, my life has just changed completely. I didn't remember her. I know that sounds awful, but there was 40 or 50 people up front, and I was just trying to get to everybody I could along with a bunch of others. It was very chaotic in a beautiful way. But she remembered. And apparently that first time, I had made an impact that was life-changing for her. Even if I had never heard that story, it wouldn't have changed the truth that her life was changed by a choice that we made of holding that event and by God's grace and working through me that night. You never know the difference you're going to make in someone's life, but the only way you're going to accomplish the opportunity in the first place is by accepting Christ as your Savior and beginning to live like it means something to us. So that means our thoughts, our words, our actions all have to reflect that we love Jesus and that we believe he saved us. Otherwise, we live into what the world expects. A bunch of Christians who say they believe, but then they walk out the doors and deny Christ by their lifestyle. So when you go from this place today, I encourage you to consider in your own heart, do I have a relationship with Jesus? Have I accepted him into my life? And if you haven't, I'm more than happy to have a conversation with you about that after church. But if you have, consider who are the people God is calling upon you to step up for and how can you be that disciple who makes a difference in the world today? Because remember, there are options to our eternity. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this morning I thank you. I thank you, God, for the way that you bless us and the way that you give us a chance to know you so that we, we have a chance to go to heaven. And God, we don't have to wait to experience that. If we start turning our hearts over to you now, we begin to experience some of the blessings of heaven, some of the joy, some of the peace, some of the, the lessening of anxiousness, the amazing ways that you can touch our lives, Jesus. And God, I pray today for anyone in here who has not accepted you into their heart, that they would have the courage to do so today and that they would be willing to talk with me afterwards. But God, for all of us, give us the courage to face the future that you have for us unafraid as you call us into the mission field known as the planet Earth. For all are called to be saved. Help us to be the bringers of that message, Jesus. And in honor of you this morning, we come together praying the prayer you taught your disciples to pray in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want us to invite us to stand out as we join our closing worship, beginning with the testimony of our faith we believe. Please stand. In this time of desperation, 
and all we know is doubt and fear. There is only one foundation we believe, we believe in this broken generation. When all is dark, you help us see. There is only one salvation we believe we believe believe that Christ is going to return because if there's nothing else in this world that we can count on is that he is our hope. And so as we close out our worship this morning, church, let's declare that Jesus is our living hope.
God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to go this day in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, accepting Christ as your Savior and changing the world. Go in peace and serve the Lord, and remember that God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Amen.